Now, of course, life is not always so simple that you can separate out each effect and study that individually, everything happens together, right. So, here all of this is taken together, for instance, the sulphate to C3A ratio and the alkali content of the cement, right. So, here what they are talking about is you can divide your composition into different regions. If you have very high alkalis and you also get much higher sulphate to C3A ratio, not C3A to sulphate, but sulphate to C3A ratio, you can have compatible and robust combinations. Now, in between they describe it as compatible and robust with some negatives, it is not always compatible and robust, but when you have very low solubility of the sulphate to C3A ratio irrespective of the alkali content, especially at low alkali content, you have a problem with respect to compatibility, okay. So, you need to add additional alkalis there or alkali sulphates there to really get your compatibility happening. Now, what is robustness? It is a very interesting term as far as concrete mix design is concerned. When, when do you call a concrete mixture robust? So, we make concrete mix in the lab and we expect that to perform the same way in the field, right. We make concrete mix designs typically in the form of kilogram per cubic meter of material. We design the mix with a particular water cement ratio, we expect a certain workability, a certain strength, right. When we take it to the field, there could be variations on a daily basis with respect to the moisture in the aggregate. You may want to check the aggregate moisture as often as possible, but it is not practically possible to do this for every mix that you make, right. How much is the capacity of a mixer in a typical batching plant? Any idea? What, what is the minimum capacity typically that you see in batching plants? At least a half cubic meter, but what is the size of the a batch that is typically prepared in the lab. Have you had the lab yet? Have you prepared concrete in the lab? No. At least research scholars have. How much concrete do you prepare in the lab? Huh? How many kilograms? Each cube is how many kilograms? 150 mm cube about 8, 8 to 8 and a half kilograms, right. So, if you have to make 6 cubes, you need at least 60 kilograms of mix, right. You would not mix more than 100 kilograms anyway, because mixers typically available in labs are of that size. So, 100 kilograms is hardly anything, 100 by 2400 if you want to convert to cubic meter, right. That is hardly anything. There the size is 0.5 cubic meter, okay. So, in such instances, there may be variations in the moisture content that you find in your system. Now, robust mix is that which still results in the ideal combination of workability and strength despite minor variations in water content and in super plus size content. Oops, what happened here? Yeah, okay. So, you have to imagine that everything that you do in the lab, you cannot translate as it is into the field. So, there will be variability, there will be much greater variability than you see in the lab you should be able to still afford some degree of change from the actual mix design that you do not do it intentionally, but even if that happens you, your workability and strength should not get affected, okay. So, a robust mix is something that is designed in such a way. So, if you have to really take up a, a design to be robust, you should be doing all of these things in the lab. It is not just one mix design, you should also vary your super plus size of dosage and water content up and down by at least 5 to 10 kilogram per cubic meter for the water and a small amount for the super plus size to ensure that your concrete mix is still able to retain its property, because all that will affect the long term performance. Even for instance, when you make a mix for a concrete in a project, the product project duration need not be just a month, right. Your project duration could be a year, sometimes 2 years, 3, 4, 5 years, right that mix design that you made on day 0 now has to be valid for the full 5 years. When you are working with possibly different batches of cement, you are working with different batches of admixture, you are working with different sources of aggregate, 
how do you ensure that your mix is good enough to last for 5 years? You are not, nobody can be such a genius that they can produce a single mix that will last for 5 years. That is where you need to assess this robustness before you really take these mixes to the field. And again, I keep talking about this in many uh, fora that this aspect of concrete mix design is really given a very shabby treatment in most construction projects. When, so typically when the site is ready to receive concrete, that is when they ask for the mix design. That is the kind of preparation that we do for concrete mix design. But if you have to look at all of these effects and I am only talking about workability here. So if you think about long term properties, strength, shrinkage, durability, all of those things need time to get evaluated. So unless you have time, you cannot really do this. You cannot just rely on the fact that okay, I use this concrete mix 10 years ago, let me use the same thing. And in most projects, unfortunately, that is still the mentality that is being followed. Anyway, we will come back to that some other time also. When you have other ingredients which can pose some issues because of their structure, you need to be further careful about your compatibility. So here especially today, there is a lot of interest in use of calcined clay as a replacement of cement because people have estimated that worldwide resources of other supplementary materials are not as plentiful as calcined clay. So there is renewed interest in calcined clay, but the structure of clay is such that <coughs> it makes workability a difficult thing to achieve, right. So you know that surface adsorption will happen, clays have much greater surfaces because of their plate like texture, right. So when you have the platelets, you have the PCE molecules that can get adsorbed on the surface of the clay and in between the platelets. So there is some loss of the superplasticizer molecules in between the platelets of clay. So when clay based systems are used, not natural clay but calcined clay, we have to take the clay and calcine it, only then it becomes reactive. We will come, come to that when we talk about calcined clay based systems in the mineral admixtures chapter, right. So these admixtures can get between the plates. We call this process as intercalation, right. Loss of the superplasticizer molecules between the plates of the calcined clay. And this is happening because the clays or the interlayer space in the clays has a net charge and that is sort of attracting the superplasticizer inside, okay. So here for instance, the structure of the Mott-Morlanite uh, clay is given here. You have silanol groups of the clay layer. And then the interlayer water that is present as bridging molecules between the plates of clay. So your polyglycol or your uh, polyglycol that is coming from your polycarboxylic ether can have a tendency to get trapped inside here because of the charges that are present here. Okay. So clays will cause a major problem with your workability, calcine clays. That is where you need to exercise judgment in choosing the right kind of superplasticizer that can make clay based systems work. So we talked about the use of marsh cone right to check the, sup, uh, the saturation dosage of the superplasticizer. The same test can also be used to check the compatibility, okay. There are different methods suggested, not all of these have the same technique, but there are different methods suggested you can use either one of these. So, when you plot the flow time versus SP dosage, as we understand that as the dosage increases, the flow time will keep on reducing, but beyond a certain point, there will not be a significant reduction in the flow time. That means we have already saturated the cement surfaces with respect to the admixture adsorption. No further adsorption is taking place. So when you do this test at 0 minutes and repeat the same test at 60 minutes, after 60 minutes of mixing, you repeat the same test, what you will see obviously is that your curve will shift to the right. That means to produce the same uh, flow, you have the need for a higher SP dosage. But what will happen is, if you are beyond optimum dosage, the two curves at 0 and 60 minutes start coinciding. Okay, this will obviously happen in a system that does not have accelerated setting. Those effects are going to be quite different. Here in a system that is compatible, you will see that the two curves start coinciding. The other possibility of or sorry, sorry, so for an incompatible combination, the entire curve will be shifted upwards. You will not have any 
coincidence in the curves beyond the optimum dosage. The other possibility is that we talked about this when we discussed the marsh cone test that if the adsorption is simply not getting completed this will keep on going down right of course it cannot come to 0 but it will keep on going down that means you are not able to saturate your system alternatively if the superplasticizer starts causing bleeding the curve may start moving up so that is also the sign of an incompatible combination a compatible combination will achieve saturation and they will not see a major effect in the workability after that. Mind you when you do this test you are adding more and more dosages of superplasticizer and we discussed that the superplasticizer formulations that are available are partly solids partly water 40 percent solids typically right 40 or 30 percent that means remaining 60 to 70 percent is just water. So, you have to do this experiment keeping in mind that you are adding this extra water from the SP also. So, that has to be subtracted from the mixed water to get the same water to cement ratio right for that what do you need to do you need to test the solids content of the SP first when you get the super plus size of a testing you should check the solids content how will you check the solids content. take some mass of the super plus sizer put it in the oven at 100 degrees you remove the water only the polymer gets left behind. So, you have only problem is some polymers also start degrading before 100 degrees Celsius. So, you have to be a little careful in adopting the right strategy for determining solids content, but you have to have an idea about that before you do this test again not sophisticated you just need an oven. So, any site lab can also have an oven anyway you have ovens for measuring moisture content of the aggregate and all you need for this test is that flow cone which can be fabricated you do not even need to buy it any workshop can produce it and you also need a stopwatch to measure the time that it takes for the thing to flow out graduated cylinders are anyway there in most site lamps ok. Now, it is also important as a practical concrete engineer to be aware of what is the extent of possibility of using these materials how far can I go can I use any any chemical in any concrete mixture I should not do that because I am just wasting my time if I start off my mix design with all possible combinations I have to know what the limitations are right. So, first generation high range water reducers like lignosulfonates they already need your concrete to be somewhat wet they need an initial workability itself about 75 millimeters to be able to act further ok. So, this level of workability in most concretes you will achieve it around 0.45 to 0.5 water to cement ratio ok. So, the slump is increased up to 150 to 200 mm ok. More than water cement ratio you should probably take a look at a typical water content ok. So, generally let us say let us assume a cement content of 400 kilogram per cubic meter right in, the, in this case then 0.45 into 400 that becomes 180 water content about 180 kilogram per cubic meter or liters per cubic meter right that is the extent of water that should be there in your mix for the lignosulfonate superplasticizer to be effective. The sulfonated naphthalene formaldehydes or melamine formaldehydes can work with reasonably low slump concretes about 25 to 50 mm slump corresponding to water cement ratio 0 0.35 to 0 0.4 to increase the slump to about 250 mm. So, what does this correspond to 0 0.35 into 400 is how much 140 to 160. In fact, I would not really consider 140 as effective for SNF it will be very difficult to get much effectiveness out of this I would rather go with about 160 to 180 ok. 160 to 180 is something that you need for SNFs to be effective if you are anywhere less than 160 I mean I am not saying there are formally uh, there are concretes where SNF cannot be used if it is water content of less than 160 people have used it it is possible, but it becomes more and more of a stretch you need to keep on adding more admixture which is not really good because you get retardation you have other problems of low strength and so on. So, if it is less than 160 today the ideal choice is to go with a polycarboxylic ether or third generation superplasticizer. So, all your self compacting concretes where 
you need extremely high flow right in such cases you need to control the water content also to ensure that you have a suitable material of the right kind of strengths right in such cases you have to achieve it by using the third generation admixtures. Now it does not always work this way uh, there are sites where people will tell you that you have to use only SNF why is that because it is cheaper the product is cheaper because people are still not taking a look at how effective it is in concrete before they decide on the cost they look at the overall the initial product cost okay so that you need to be a bit wary of the guys who make the decisions in most construction companies are the people who have no idea about civil engineering so you need to contend with these people and get them to understand that technically things have to be sound only then things work okay it is a difficult battle I can tell you that having been involved in many of these projects very difficult battle okay. even civil engineers who become upper management seem to cloud themselves when it comes to technical aspects and only worry about economy but you cannot achieve everything with just economy you have to ensure that the technically sound solution is used ultimately it will become economically more fav favorable also. So, that is something that the responsibility is up to you to really convince your bosses to ensure that they make the technically sound judgment. Now, I am just showing you some results from IIT Madras studies. So, we had done several different uh, types of cements to try and understand whether this concept of saturation does it really work, concept of compatibility does it really work. So, here there are three cements C1, C2, and C3, they have very different chemical compositions okay I am I'll, I'll, I'll show you that a little bit later but what you see is entirely different effects produced by sulfonated naphthalene formaldehyde and polycarboxyl ether. So we looked at one definition of compatibility where when the test marsh cone test was done at 60 minutes the curves should start coinciding after the optimal dosage right. So in the case of let us say C1 with SNF admixture is that compatible or not compatible it is mostly incompatible right because the curves are not coinciding by that definition of compatibility C2 it is compatible right the curves are coinciding and what do you think would be the optimum dosage here should you take it here or here it is better to take it at this point right what about C3 it is little bit interesting it seems to be apart but more or less similar because this is actually actual flow time not the log so the difference is not that great we can consider it to be compatible but what is happening is your optimal dosage is or saturation dosage is shifted way to the right what could be the reasons for this the C3 cement has an optimum or saturation dosage which is shifted far to the right sorry fineness, fineness yeah could be one reason in fact in this case that was the reason C3 was much finer as compared to C1 and C2 it required much greater SP dosage and the same effect you can see here also in PCE also the extent of fineness of C3 caused the saturation dosage to be much higher but what do you notice as the difference between SNF and PCE in all cases PCE produced compatible combination with all three cements you had the same issue of higher dosage required for C3 but none of the things were incompatible if you compare C1 here this is C1 you see this curve at 0 minutes and the curve at 60 minutes coinci coinciding after the saturation dosage okay. So yes this concept of compatibility is clearly indicated here what you also see is the dosage is required for saturation with C1 PCE you required 0 0.066 percent C2 0 0.066 C3 0 0.165 much greater dosage of PCE but as compared to PCE if you look at SNF you need much higher dosages okay for saturation look at the workability produced this is the spread in mini slump what is presented here is the spread in millimeters from 
mini slump test. What does this mean? That you are producing with SNF and PCE nearly similar workabilities, okay. maybe slightly higher with PCE, but nearly similar, but all this you are obtaining at a much lower dosage of PCE. Okay. Again, effectiveness, very important to understand. If you look at lignosulfonate, saturation is obtained, but look at the workabilities. It does not really have that ability to produce a highly workable material. Similarly, melamine formaldehydes, similar dosages, but workabilities are not really good with C2 and C3. So, you have to evaluate how effective your admixture is going to be with the type of cement. Now, obviously, you will be asking, okay, this is all on cement paste. I want to see the effect in concrete. Do we get the same effect in concrete? And that is what is being seen here. So, here we produced a control mix without any admixture at 0.45 water to cement ratio, right. And with the four different super plus sizes at 0.35 water cement ratio, that means my water reduction, percentage water reduction is how much? What is the difference in water cement ratios? 0 0.1 divided by the original water cement ratio is 0.45 into 100. So, that is nearly about how much? How many percentage? About, about 22 percent, let us say. Okay. So, we all know that at this what is cement ratio, your lignosulfonate is not going to be effective at all, right. So, your control mix produced workabilities of 170 to 180 for C1 and C2 and the lower slump for C3. Why? Because C3 was finer as you rightly said earlier, right. So, finer material ab absorbs more moisture water is not freely available to provide workability, so you get lower workability. And that slump was not getting retained much, you see that after 10, uh, 60 minutes almost 0 slump in all of these cases, right. With lignosulfonate, you are not getting the effectiveness at all. That means that this water cement ratio is not working to produce a high slump. And of course, initial slump itself is bad, so workability retention is going to be bad. What about sulfonate and naphthalene formaldehyde? it is able to produce a fairly good initial workability, but then it is losing workability quite quickly. What about PCE? Better workability and better retention of workability at 60 minutes. What about strengths? At 3 days, the control mix is giving around 20. Again, the finer cement is given higher strength, expected faster reaction. Okay, By 7 days, that difference comes down. Okay, that is also expected. Okay. Now, compared to this, look at how much strength the PCE mixture is given, okay, nearly 1.5 times or more than 1.5 times, okay. but at 7 days, that difference is not 1.5, but about 1.2, 1.3 times. If you look at uh, the codes, I will talk about the codes later, it seems to match with what is expected. Similarly, the strengths produced with SNF and SMF at 7 days are still okay, but you are not getting any strength with the lignosulfonate. Even though water cement ratio is 0.35, you are not getting a strength which is much greater. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? We talked about this, right? When first generation water reducers are used as super plasticizers, you have to add too much of it to really make it effective, and that causes strength retardation. So, of course, I do not have data for 28 days. At 28 days, if I had done a comparison, I may have had a slightly better improvement in the strength, but by 7 days, I did not really get the strength because retardation was too much with the lignosulfonate. Okay. So, again, what we are seeing with the respect to PACE studies is that our experience in concrete is also sort of matching the expectations. So, this concept of saturation, it helps to reduce the extent of mixture proportioning trials that you get, that you have to do to get the required characteristics in terms of strength and workability. Okay.